Genesis chapter 25. If you have your Bible, please open it so that we can read together. I'm reading the Amplified Version. So Genesis 25, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She gave birth to Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Leomim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Hanok, Abida, and Ilda. All these were the sons of Keturah. Now Abraham gave everything that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them to the east country, far away from Isaac, his son. The days of Abraham's life were a hundred and seventy-five years. Then Abraham breathed his last, and he died at a good old age, an old man who was satisfied and he was gathered to his people. So his sons, Ishmael and Isaac, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is east of Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried with Sarah, his wife. Now after the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived at Beer Lahai Roy. Now these are the records of the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in order of their births. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Adbil, Mizbam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Nafish and Kidima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their settlements and by their encampments. Twelve princes according to their tribes. Ishmael lived a hundred and thirty seven years. Then he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people. Ishmael's sons settled from Havila to Shor, which is east of Egypt, as one goes towards Assyria. He settled opposite all his relatives. Now these are the records of the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, of Padan Aram, the sister of Liban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was unable to conceive children. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it is so, then why am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and the separation of two nations has begun in your body. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out reddish all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand grasped Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau was an able and and skilled hunter, a man of the outdoors, but Jacob was a quiet and peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating his, his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Jacob had cooked stew when Esau came from the field and was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a quick swallow of that red stuff there because I am exhausted and famished. For that reason, Esau was called Edom. Jacob answered, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Look, I am about to die. So what of, so, 
so of what use is this birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear an oath to me today that you are selling it to me for this food. So he swore an oath to him and sold him his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and got up and went on his way. In this way, Esau scorned his birthright. So in this chapter, Abraham, first of all, got married to another woman. So Sarah died when Abraham was about, um, how old was he? About maybe around the 130, 47, right? And he lived till he was 175. So he lived 38 extra years after he, after Sarah died. And I'm pretty sure he didn't want to be alone for those 38 years. So after Sarah died, he married another woman whose name is Keturah. And they had six children. So all in all, Abraham had eight children. He had Isaac. He had Ishmael. Then he had six children by Keturah. So we can see how faithful God is to Abraham, right? When God told him he will make him a father of many nations. And he struggled for a long time just to get one child. But at the end of his life, he had eight children, not to mention his grandchildren that he had already seen. He had seen some from Ishmael. He had seen um, Jacob and Esau from Isaac before he died. I'm not sure if he saw the ones from Keturah. But anyways, he died at 175, and his sons, Ishmael and Isaac, buried him later on in the chapter we see that um rebecca is struggling to have kids it, it took her 20 years to conceive um isaac was 40 years old when he married her and before she conceived she was 60. so she finally conceived and she gave birth to twins one was called esau the older one who came out first and the other was called jacob so we can see how faithful god is right um that god always answers prayers so these people were barren for 20 years and i'm sure maybe after about five years of praying it would have seemed like god where are you are you not going to hear are you going to ignore us forever is God not going to answer this prayer? How long will we cry? How long will we fast? How long will I hold on in faith? And I know generally it happens to all of us when you're holding on to God for something and you're just like, God, why is this taking so long? How long will I ask you for this? How long will I believe you? How long will I hold on? Right. But keep holding on because God is faithful. And God answers prayers, even though it took them 20 years. But at the end of the day, God answered their prayers. They, they were in barren till they died. They gave birth to kids, and those kids were two nations. So we have to keep trusting God, right? Sometimes um, some things just take long spiritually. Sometimes some prayers you pray, you get an answer the next day. Some you have to keep pushing you have to keep pushing you have to be determined you have to be consistent you can't just pray and see. and after a while if it doesn't happen you let it go right so you need to pray you also need prayer partners it's very it's very important to have people you can pray with because the bible says that isaac entreated the lord on behalf of his wife so she wasn't struggling with this prayer point alone right because sometimes praying one prayer point alone it can get tiring, it can get weary, right? Sometimes you need someone who just provides, I don't know, a fresh perspective on the issue, who can speak to you, who can encourage you, who can even pray with you. So you're not the one praying this time, you're just saying amen. So you're piggybacking on that person's strength. So it's good to have prayer partners. Don't try and, nobody's an island, don't try and struggle alone, especially if you're, if you're praying about something and it's taking some time or your faith is failing, right? You can always reach out to a friend, a Christian friend, and they will stand with you. 
So the Bible says she conceived. And you would have thought that because God was in the conception, everything would just be smooth. But when she conceived, the Bible says the children struggled together within her. So she was pregnant, all right, and the children were always fighting and inside her. So I'm, I'm pretty sure she didn't know they were fighting, right? But she just knew that these children are not behaving like normal children, as if something is wrong with this pregnancy. Imagine if you're pregnant and your baby is kicking every two seconds. Every two seconds he's kicking, every two seconds he's moving, every two seconds he's kicking. I mean, you're going to go to a doctor and be like, I, I don't think my, my pregnancy is normal because babies don't kick every two seconds. Isn't, isn't he going to sleep? Isn't he going to rest? How can, how can he be just be active every two seconds? So this was what was going on with Rebecca. And it's almost like I thought God blessed me. Right, because children are a blessing from the Lord, especially in those days. They saw now we just take it for granted that everybody has kids. But in those days, right, and people who didn't have kids were seen as being cursed by God. That's how they saw them. If you couldn't give birth, you were seen as cursed. And any and when you finally gave birth, you were seen as blessed that God has finally blessed you. So it was like if God has blessed me, why is why is this happening? Why is it a struggle? Why is there still a battle? Why do I still have to fight for some things? Why is it not smooth? So she was like, she said, verse 22, if it be so, why am I thus? So if God has finally answered me, why is it looking like there's still more of a struggle, right? So the fundamental question is, sometimes God opens a door, and when you get into that door, there's still a battle waiting, and you're like, ah. I thought God is the one that opened this door. Why, why is there still a battle, right? Or maybe you, you, you pray, you're praying for a particular job, you get the job, and when you resume, there's now an opposition. Then you are not even sure again that, ah, is it God that blessed me? Is it not God that blessed me? Why is it looking like something? Why is it difficult? Why is there a struggle? Why is there a fight? It's like Moses who God said, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And because you would have thought, you know, when God speaks now, it should just happen. It should be smooth. But he went to tell Pharaoh, and Pharaoh sent him out of his palace. He said, get out. I'm not listening. So, even Moses came back to God. We'll get to the book of Exodus. And Moses was like, God, did you send me or did you not send me? If you didn't send me, tell me. Because if you sent me, I don't understand how you can send me and a man who say no. So, the point I'm making is... um. There are battles, even when you are doing what God wants, even when God opens a door, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything will go smoothly. Sometimes it does, it's just smooth, it's just easy. But sometimes you get to the promised land and there are people there and you have to fight them to take the land. Sometimes God gives you a land, you get there, there are people there and you have to fight them to take the land. So it's not every time there's a struggle that it means that God is not with you or you strayed out of God's will, right? Sometimes when God opens the door and the door is a very big door or the, or it's a very, I don't know what word to use, it's, let's just say it's a big door. Because of the size of what is on the other side of the door, there's a battle to stop you from truly entering into the door. But... Is that's why it's good to keep going back to God. So every time this kind of things happened, people went back and God reassured them. So let's say you get, you ask God for a job, and then you got the job, and when you got there, it's looking like God didn't give you a good job. There are battles everywhere. You can now go back to God and say, God, what is happening? That's what Rebecca did, because it's from God that you get comfort, you get confirmation. Because sometimes God speaks to you, He says, Do this. And when you do it, it doesn't turn out how you expected it to turn out. It, sometimes it turns out in the opposite direction. And you're not sure anymore. Like, did God speak? Did God not speak? If God spoke, then why? Why? How come I obeyed? And it's, it's not looking like what I expected. So every time this happened, people went back to God to confirm. So Moses, after Pharaoh refused and booted him out of the palace, 
he went back and talked to God, and God reassured him that eventually they would, he would be de- um, the children of Israel will be delivered. God told him that Pharaoh will refuse Pharaoh's heart to be had, but eventually they'll be delivered. So he got comfort from God, knowing that even though it looks like it's not working, I'm still in God's will, right? It's the same thing with Rebecca, with the children busy kicking 24-7. She went back to God. The Bible says that she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. So God explained what was going on. There are two nations, one will be stronger than the other. So even though the children, when she went to God, the children didn't stop kicking and they didn't stop fighting after she went to ask God what happened. But she gained comfort in the midst of the battle knowing that she is still in god's will so what is what is terrifying what makes people anxious is when maybe god speaks or you thought god opened the door then when you walk through the door everywhere is just scattered and you're just they they it's just looking like this cannot be god so that anxiety that place of uncertainty where you are not sure did God speak? Did God not speak? I thought I heard God. Did I make a mistake? And it's because of the result of the action. That place is a very um, unsettling place to be. It's full of worry. It's full of fear. Have I jeopardized my, I don't know, have I made the wrong decision? It's just full of a lot of, I don't know the word to use. So what we do when we're in those situations, it happens to everybody, right? When God speaks, you take a decision and it doesn't turn out how you thought, Right? It happens to everyone, even in the Bible. We're seeing Bible characters who it happened to. So the only way to regain your comfort and your stability and be established, even in the midst of the trials, is to go back to God and hear what God will say. Because if he spoke to you before, he will speak to you again. So we see, um, what was her name? Rebecca. She had two kids. Before they were even born, this woman was... She was a spiritual lady. So she prayed and she discerned the destiny of her children. God told her that the elder shall serve the younger. There are two nations in thy womb. So by the time the children were born, she understood God's plan for each of her children. She understood God's plan for each of her children. So nowadays, people don't bother to pray and find out what God wants their children to do. People just decide that I want my son to be a lawyer and they force the poor child into law school, right? Someone decides I want my child to be an engineer and either they force him like by force or they stylishly push him in the direction of engineering without the child even knowing he's being steered in the direction that his parents want him to go. And sometimes it's not like from a piece of place of wickedness or you know, from an evil heart. It's just that as a parent, let's say you've always wanted, I don't know, you've always wanted your children to do something that you think is noteworthy or something that you think is worthy of praise. So you imagine, oh, I want a son who's a lawyer. I want a daughter who is an astronaut. I want a son who is a businessman. So you want something that is worthy of praise, right? something that um, even the, the society will value. Right? So, Sometimes inadvertently, you start to steer your children in a direction that you think will be good for them. Right? It may be good for them, but it may not be God's will for them. So steering your child in a particular direction, I want him to be an engineer because, I mean, tech workers are paid very well nowadays, right? So you try to steer your child to learn how to code or you, you try to push someone into, I don't know, finance so you can work at JP Morgan or one of the big banks, Morgan Stanley, or whatever. Because sometimes when you do that, you can push your children out of God's will. So we don't just push or try to encourage children or try to move them into career paths because we think they are lucrative or because it is our dream for them. So sometimes people even project their own dreams on top of their children. So you wanted to be a lawyer but you couldn't achieve it for one reason or the other. So you project that dream on top of your child. So it's something you wanted for yourself, but since you couldn't achieve it, you want your child to vicariously achieve it in your stead. So the child will achieve it on behalf of you. Or someone wanted to be a footballer, he couldn't make it, then he has a son, 
and he buys him a football immediately and hopes that he becomes a footballer tries to push him into football so that that thing he wanted to do that he couldn't achieve he wants his child to do it so he can be proud of the child so sometimes we, you even people that are not even married they already have plans for their children i want to check you i want my daughter to do this i want my son to do this you're already daydreaming it's not bad right but when the children come you now have to be like rebecca and ask god what is your own plan for these children so that you are not the one who becomes a stumbling block in your children's destiny to be very sad if on on judgment day a parent finds out that it was he or she that stared his child out of god's will for for the child's life right it's it's not it's not something that will make you happy so People are already dreaming of, I want my son to do this. I want my son, daughter to do this. I want my child to achieve this. It's not a bad thing, but you need to ask God. So God, I have this child. Where do you want this child to go? What do you want him to do? So when the child comes, even if the child is even going in another direction, you can even help the child to, and realign the child to God's will. So even if the child comes and wants to do something else, you can prayerfully and carefully encourage him to come back into what god wants him to do so please pray for your children even if you're not married it's not too late i'll be sorry it's not too early to start asking god what do you want my kids to do if i mean if you're in ministry it's not compulsory god wants your children in ministry it's not it's not really by force if you're a businessman right you already have a business and you imagine that my children will take over for my business god's plan for your children may not be for them to take over from your business so we need to ask God, what does God want to do with them so that we can allow God to use our children. So we go on later in the chapter and the Bible says that, where is it? Um, sorry, I'm looking for the verse. Anyways, let me just quote it. I think it's verse 28. It said, And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So these parents had basically picked a favorite child. This is what started the, the downfall of the nation of Israel. The entire nation of Israel, right? The downfall started from Isaac loving Esau and Jacob sorry yes isaac loving esau and rebecca loving jacob and uh, before now if you stop we're going i don't want to preempt or spoil what's going to happen in other chapters but i'll just give you a hint if you if you've actually read the bible before before now every this the nation of israel has been started with abraham he's the father right before now everything has been smooth smooth in terms of you don't see infighting you don't see um backstabbing betrayal selling into slavery worshiping of other gods stubbornness and all the things that god doesn't like so from abraham to isaac everything is smooth isaac and his wife everything is still okay they are not rebelling against god they are not misbehaving and everything but when they gave birth to children i'm going to stop here because i don't want to spoil it but from the moment that they decided to have favorites. Everything just went downhill. It started from this tiny decision. And because I don't want to spoil it, I'll just stop here. But favoritism is always is terrible. It's really terrible. And we have to guard against it, especially if you're a parent. So um Jacob was in it was at home. He made some stew. His brother, Esau, was a hunter. So he just came from the field. He had finished hunting. And he was famished or he was very hungry. So he came and he asked his brother for some stew. Give me some stew so that I can eat. And his brother said, before I can give you this stew, sell me your birthright. So in, th in those days, the birthright is, was the right of the firstborn to have a double portion of everything the father owned. So let's say... Your father had a hundred. Let's say you have two children, right? And your father's estate is worth a hundred million. So the firstborn will have double of whatever goes to the sec to the second born. He must have at least double. So if the second born gets, 
like out of the 100 million let's say he gets um 30 million right the first bomb must get at least 60. so let's say there were three children right and the father's estate was worth 100 million so if this if one of them got 30 the second bomb the first bomb must get 60. then that 60 plus 30 is 19. the remaining 10 will go to the third person so if there are three children and the father's estate is worth 100 million the first bomb must get double of what anybody else gets so if the second bomb gets 30 million the first bomb must get 60 that's 90 then the last person will take 10. so the birthright was the right to get at least a double portion of what if, if everybody got five thousand camels you will get ten thousand if they got five thousand sheep you will get ten thousand if they got ten thousand goats you will get twenty thousand so it was the right of the firstborn to get at least double what everybody got and also the right so the firstborn was also the one who was the head of the family and he was like he took decisions and he became like the president of of the family so those were the two things that were associated with being the firstborn so esau had this as the firstborn a right to the double portion and a right to be the head of the family after the father died but because they were also in the, the covenant so this was not just in an earthly family right this is family of abraham because they were also in the covenant the firstborn also had the right to the blessing of abraham so in addition to the physical things the firstborn was supposed to inherit the blessing of abraham so esau came from the field hungry he saw his brother jacob please give me some stew let me eat then jacob was like sell me your best rights for this stew and Esau was like i'm about to die that means i don't know why he thought he was about to die so maybe he was exaggerating i don't know or maybe he was really about to die who knows but anyways he was very very hungry and he was like i'm about to die so what use is my birthright so is jacob said swear to me that you sell me your birthright for this porridge for this stew and Esau swore and he took the birthright he ate the stew jacob gave esau the stew and esau swore his birthright to what's his name jacob and the bible says esau despised his birthright so what esau did was trade something that was physical for something that was spiritual because in his case the birthright was not really about the sheep and goats so in other families right the birthright is about physical things because they are not in the line of co of the covenant they don't have the blessing of abraham so for general families the birthright is about money material things good sheep whatever but for those in the line of abraham the birthright is not about sheep and goats it's about the blessing of abraham so it's a spiritual thing so Esau traded something that was spiritual for something that was carnal for something that was fleshly for something that was physical he traded his birthright to to pleasure his flesh so let me read let me read one part of the bible matthew chapter 6 i'll read verse 19 and this is jesus speaking to his disciples he said lay not lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also so jesus is telling them that they shouldn't store treasures for themselves in earth where moth or insects can come and eat the treasures or where rust can destroy the treasures or where thieves can come and break the treasures so he says they should not stay, um, store up treasures for themselves they should not lay up that means to work for treasures on earth but they should labor to have treasures in heaven then he says where your treasure is um that's where your heart will be so people have this idea that in heaven when we get to heaven everybody has a reward everybody doesn't have a reward in heaven the Bible never says that there is a free reward for everybody in heaven. Jesus says that they should lay up 
the treasures in heaven. In other words, they have to work for it. So he was comparing the way people lay up treasures on earth. So what is your treasure? Your money, right? Your the, your your shares, if you have shares, if you have stocks, if you have bonds, whatever is in your retirement account, your house, your cars. Those are your treasures. Those are your assets. And they are not free. You work for them. You lay them up. You go to school. You go to work. You study. You invest. You save. So that process of laying up treasures, you are laboring for it. You are working for it. So Jesus says they shouldn't lay up treasures on earth, but they should lay up treasures in heaven. In other words, there's something they have to do to actually, to actually have a reward in heaven. There's something they have, they have to do to actually have a reward in heaven. Because if it was automatic that everybody that gets to heaven just has a reward, then there's no point in Jesus telling them to lay up treasures in heaven. He would just say, when you get to heaven, your reward is waiting. But he never said that. He said they have to lay it up. He didn't say, when you just get to heaven, you just receive a free reward. No. He says you have to lay it up. You have to work for it. You have to labor for it. That's what he was telling them. So it would be unfair of God, right? Let's say... Let's use someone like Moses, right? Moses was in Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh, very rich, established, powerful. He forsook all those things because he wanted to follow God, left the wealth of Egypt, left the fame, left the recognition. He ran into the wilderness. A 40-year-old man ran into the wilderness. He was there, for suffered there for another 40 years, right? 80 by this time. At this time, God now called him to come and Deliver the children of Israel from from slavery, and he spent another forty years leading them into the promised land. So Moses dedicated eighty years of his life to God, eighty full years, eighty difficult years, and all those eighty years were spent in the wilderness, on the backside of the desert, under the sun, laboring, dealing with stubborn Israelites, who sometimes they want to stone him, sometimes they are insulting him. And sometimes the burden was too much that he had to ask God to, to, to share the burden with other elders in Israel, the burden of leading Israel. So somebody like that who, who suffered to serve God for 80 years, he gets to heaven. Then somebody who was just on earth watching Netflix, facing his business, right? All his life was just his career, his business, watching Netflix when he's free, going on Instagram, going on TikTok. Just eating, enjoying himself. He didn't even win one soul all the days of his life. One soul he didn't win. It would be actually be unfair of God to, to give both of them a reward in heaven. It would be unfair. Because Moses suffered. He suffered. He worked hard for God. He sacrificed a lot for God. So it would be unfair of God to give Moses a reward. Then that person who did absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Apart from ask God for money, cars, houses, and to bless him. But he didn't he didn't lift a finger. Even going to church regularly, he didn't go. Even to live above sin. He was busy doing well under grace. So he would deliberately fornicate and, and repent. Deliberately fornicate and repent. While Moses, he stayed in righteousness. It would be unfair if God give them the same give two of them a reward. So Apostle Paul came to this earth, suffered for, for the gospel. They beat him. They even killed him. God had to resurrect him to continue the work of the gospel. They afflicted him. They threw him in prison. They stoned him. They flogged him. He was betrayed. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten by snakes. He was stranded on island. People swore an oath that they would not eat until they kill him. So all this he was doing was not because... He was, he was believing God for breakthrough. He just wanted to serve the Lord. So it would actually be unfair to get to heaven. Then you who spent all your free time watching Stranger Things didn't lift a finger for the kingdom of God. Then you and Apostle Paul now have a reward. It's not possible. It would be unfair. God would be unfair if he does that. It would be unfair. He says, I will not forget your labor of love. So you that doesn't have any labor, you can't expect anything in heaven. You don't have any labor. You didn't do anything. So this is what Jesus was telling them. 
that the way people work for physical things, you work for houses, work for cars, work for, I mean, jewelry, work to pay your rent, work to have nice things, work to buy shares and stocks and bonds and to have money in your IRA, right, in your retirement account. He says you can also labor to have treasures in heaven. So what people do, like Esau, is that they exchange their spiritual reward for physical pleasures on the earth. That's what Esau did. He exchanged something that was spiritual for something that was physical. So instead of somebody to dedicate himself to God while he's on earth, he will pleasure his flesh. Even to pray, he will not pray. Read his Bible, he will not read his Bible. After all, we are saved. So he will not be dedicated to God. He will not lift the finger, finger for God. He will not pursue God. He will not, he will not do anything. Because in his mind, we are saved and when we get to heaven, we will all be the same. But it will now shock him when he gets to heaven and he's expecting a mansion. And God says, you didn't lay up anything. You didn't lay up nothing. So, when you have an opportunity to, for instance, sacrifice for God. So, sacrifice some of your sleep to pray. Sacrifice some of the time you used to watch which was the reigning series now? I don't know. I don't know. They are just use Stranger Things. Sacrifice some of the th time you used to watch Stranger Things to read your Bible. What you don't know is God is giving you an opportunity to lay up in heaven. But you now become like Esau. Where you now pleasure your flesh by watching those things. So they may not be sins, but they are fleshly things, carnal things. So instead of you to lay up by chasing God, you will pleasure your flesh. You will pleasure your flesh, you will enjoy yourself, you will go to parties, you will go to restaurants, you will laugh, you will gist, you will play, you will watch, play video games. You just indulge your flesh, no sacrifice for God, you won't do anything in church, you are not serving God any way, any how, in any form. Even the barest minimum of don't sin, you will deliberately sin and repent. What you don't know is you have traded your eternal reward. For, for stew that will finish in 30 minutes. So let's say that, I don't know, let's imagine all of us are in America now, right? We're all living in America. But in two months, we are going to be in the UK. All of us are going to move to the UK, right? And we will never come back to America again. Imagine all of us are in America. In the next two months, we're going to be in the UK. I will never have the opportunity to return to America again. So the wise thing for us to do, right, is to tr start transferring our assets to the UK. So if you have a house in America, you will look for how to sell the house so you can transfer that house to the UK. Let's assume you have some shares in American companies and for some reason when you're in the UK, you can't access those shares. You will sell those shares and go and buy shares in, in UK companies. If you have a piece of land, if you have a farm in America, you sell the farm, you transfer it to where you're going. So people have treasures on earth, but they forget that we're only on this earth for two months. And in heaven, you'll be there for eternity. So you're not supposed to focus on earthly things. Focus on pleasuring your flesh, focusing on enjoying, on enjoying yourself. Knowing that one day we'll leave this place and we'll be in a permanent habitation. And it's what you labored to have, to lay up while you were here that you enjoy when you are there. So Jesus told his disciples, in my father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So everybody quotes that scripture. But they forget that God, Jesus told his disciples. So there were things that Jesus told everybody when he was talking. Everybody was there. There were things he told both the scribes, both the Pharisees, both the prostitutes, both the tax collectors, both the sinners, everybody had it. So when he spoke, he spoke to all. But there are things he spoke to only the disciples. So when he told the disciples are laborers, they are not followers. And because they are laborers, they have mansions. So the followers are the ones that come on Sunday. Only on Sunday they come to see Jesus because it's on Sunday that Jesus turns water to wine. Who doesn't want wine? So they come, they, they sip the wine, 
then they go back. They will never lift a finger to do anything for Jesus. They come on Sunday because it's on Sunday that Jesus shares fish and bread. Who does not want fish and bread? Then after Sunday, they go back, they face their business, they don't even see Jesus again. They come back the next Sunday because it's a healing service. Jesus is laying hands on people. Who doesn't want healing? So the followers, they come and go. They never do anything for God. So when the followers were with God, he never told the followers that they have mansions. So when they left, he now faced the disciples. He said, those ones they have left, you, are you going to leave? They said, where are we going? It's only you we have. I said, no problem. In my father's house, there are many mansions. They are laborers. There's no disciple that was just following Jesus and did not sacrifice for Jesus, did not do anything for Jesus, did not live for Jesus. There's none of them. So you cannot quote that scripture while living for your flesh. It's not possible. You can't be expecting mansions while doing nothing for God. Because it would be unfair for those people to leave their jobs, leave their businesses, be hated by their brothers, follow Jesus all the days of their life, and were even killed. Then when they get to heaven, they have a mansion. Then you use all your free time to play Call of Duty and FIFA. All your free time on Netflix. All your free time on Instagram. Even to read your Bible, you have not read it. You hardly even read your Bible. You hardly pray. Then you think you and the disciples have mansions? Is that not, is that not, a, is that not foolishness? You don't have anything. You have absolutely nothing. There is no reward for you. Because you didn't do anything. A reward is for service. A gift is free. I can give if I give you a gift now, you don't have to ask me what did I do. It's a gift. But if I say come, let me reward you, you will not ask me, did I do anything for you? So you can't expect a reward while doing nothing for God. There is no reward. There is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Salvation is free. Your reward is not free. It says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So you must be serving. Well done means you did something. So what did you do? What did you, If Jesus would tell you well done at the end of your days, what did you do? Well done for what? Well done for what? Good and faithful servant, where is your service? So we, we lay up treasures in heaven. How do we lay it up? First, by serving God. By sacrificing for God. You must be doing something for God. You must. You can't just be living for yourself. So we, we do it, one, by serving God. Number two, by standing in righteousness. So people compromise. People will lie when under pressure. People will sleep around for things. People will cheat to get promoted. People will deny what is in the Bible so they don't cancel them on Twitter. People will bend their values so their friends can like them. But when you stand for righteousness and you are hated, the Bible says there is a blessing. Every time you stand for righteousness and people insult you, people hate you, people cancel you, people say that you are, you, we are, you are boring, you are old school, you can't be my friend, you are not in the happening crowd. For that mockery, it says, when blessed are you when you are reviled for righteousness sake. There is a blessing. It's not every blessing you receive on earth. There are rewards in heaven. So we, we accumulate rewards by standing for righteousness. Even if we're insulted, even if we're hated, even if the society despises us, right? We accumulate a reward. So first of all, by serving God. Because when you serve God, he will not forget your labor of love and he will reward you eternally. God is an eternal being. So he doesn't just reward people with things that will end in time, cars, houses. He's an eternal spirit. So he has eternal rewards that will never, Jesus said, they don't rust. So if your reward is the car that God gave you, that car will rust. He says thieves cannot break in and steal it. If God gives you a car, people can steal it. So that's not the reward he's talking about. Yes, God blesses us with things on earth. But what Jesus was talking about, the rewards are not physical things. They are eternal things. So they reward in heaven. Number one, for serving God. Number two, for standing in righteousness. Number three, for living a life of holiness. So all these people that deliberately sin, repent, sin, repent. When you get to heaven, you will not find out that those who del who who shed who 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 sweat blood to make sure they didn't sin, they have a reward. You just sin foolishly we're under grace so you deliberately lie 
you come back and repent. Deliberately cheat, come back and repent. Plan your fornication, come back and repent. You will now find out that those like Daniel, who said, throw me in the lion's den, for that action, they have a reward. Those like Shadrach, that say, even if you put us inside fire, we will not bow, they have a reward. So those who strove for righteousness, who said, we will not take advantage of the grace of God. If the Bible says, don't lie, even if I'll be sacked, I will not lie. If the Bible says, don't cheat, I will not cheat. If the Bible says, don't fornicate, even if all the men that are coming say, I will not marry you if you don't sleep with me, I will rather be unmarried. Those who strove, who strove for righteousness, there is a reward. So all this foolishness of, after all, God is merciful, we will not go to hell. I keep saying, every time people reduce sin to whether I will go to hell or whether I will go to heaven, they are children. They are foolish. They lack understanding. Every time people reduce sin, there is more to this sin to just who will go to hell and who will go to heaven. There is a lot more. And one of it is a, the rewards you get in heaven. Do you know that part of the 144,000, the 144,000 in Revelation, one of the qualifications to be part of them is that you must not have defiled yourself in sexual immorality. The 144,000 that are separated from everybody else, that have a special place in heaven, one of their qualifications is that they, could, they should not have defiled themselves immorally. It's a reward. For that lofty position, position that they get, they must not have touched women. They must not have defiled themselves. So now they're sleeping around and say, don't worry, we're under grace. It's foolishness. So reward for serving God, reward suffering for righteousness, reward living holy, reward number four is a longing to know God. So those who chase after God, the Bible says, how does he even put it? Those who on earth, their longing is to see God. In heaven, they will see God. It's not everybody that will have the same access to God when we get to heaven. So those who, people say, oh, we'll, see, we'll all see Jesus. It will surprise some people, honestly. I won't say more than that, but it will surprise some people, honestly. If you study the book of Revelation, when John got to heaven, Jesus sat down. There were 24 people. Elders, they are human beings. Oh, I don't want to tell you who they are. When we get to Hebrews, I will show you the elders. But those elders are human beings. They are not spirits. They are physical human beings who, who, who lived on earth. So the elders sat down close to Jesus on thrones. Everybody else was standing. So what did those ones do? That they had thrones and they sat down close to Jesus. Where everybody else stood and it's from far that they were worshipping God. How come there was a division? There's some people sat down and they had thrones and they had crowns where everybody else stood and it's from far they were looking at God. So you're saying all of us will see it will shock you. You that you are not reading your Bible here, which Jesus do you want to see? You don't want to see Jesus on earth. You hardly ever open the word of God. The Jesus that, that we have here, the word, you don't open it, you don't read it, you don't pray. You are not hungry for God. You are just using God to escape hellfire and to bless him, to bless you. Then when you get to heaven, you will see Jesus. Jesus will now ask you from far. Now, when I was on earth, how many times did you read your Bible to actually see me in the Word? How many times? How many times did you study this Bible to know what is inside? So you didn't want to see Jesus on earth. There is in heaven, you see Jesus. It's a foolish joke. It will shock some, many people. Hmm. It will surprise them in heaven that they will know that people who serve God with all their strength, they are not foolish. People who, 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 who dedicate themselves to escape sin, they are not foolish. People who say, I will not take advantage of the grace of God, they, will, they are not foolish. People who suffer for righteousness, they are not foolish. People who spend time in prayer and reading the word, they are not foolish. And there is a reward for all those things. So you can't trade physical things for spiritual things. You can't. The Bible says that where your treasure is, that's what Jesus said. After he said, lay up your treasures in heaven. He now says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So many people, what the things they treasure are on earth, so they are so earthly, so fleshly. So everybody ask yourself, when was the last time by, by yourself, nobody preached the message by yourself. You just said, I can't wait to go to heaven. That you, you are actually looking forward. You are imagining yourself going to heaven. Many Christians, it doesn't even cross their mind. You, it never, maybe they only remember it when they are old. Maybe 
when a message is preached and the word heaven just comes, they just imagine heaven. But by themselves, that there's a desire to go and be with God. You see, many people, they don't desire. They are so comfortable on earth because all their treasures are here. Everything they love is here. All their heart's desire, everything is here. So because all their treasures is here, are here, their heart too is here. Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is. Your heart is. So those who serve God with all their strength, God is their treasure. So their heart is with God in heaven. Those who know that there is a reward for the things they do for God, for seriousness, for righteousness, for service. By the time they've lived 20, 30, 40 years and they've served God faithfully, they've not taken advantage of the They've lived in righteousness. After they've done that for 40 years, they know that they've accumulated a lot of reward in heaven. They can't wait to go to heaven. They can't wait. That's why if you study, if you read the New Testament, the disciples were, it's as if, if they could just jump out of their body and go to heaven, they would jump. Every time the Lord is at hand, the coming of the Lord is at hand, the day of the Lord is at hand, you know we're just in our earthly body. We've grown to be, to be taken and be closed. They could not wait to leave this earth. Do you know why? They had so labored. You know, imagine if you've, you've worked very hard for something. And you know that your reward is a billion dollars. And it's when you travel out of America and go to UK that you get that billion. Do you know that you won't be able to wait to leave America? That you've labored so hard and you know that your reward is one billion dollars. You can't wait for you to travel, leave the UK and finally be in America. They could not wait to leave this earth. Men like Abraham, the Bible says he sought a city whose builder and maker is God. They couldn't wait. For the day that God would take them, they couldn't wait. Do you know why? They, and this guy is rich. It's not, it's not because he was poor that he was waiting, looking for him to go to heaven. He's rich, but he wasn't enjoying the war. They've labored so hard. They sacrificed. He has left his father's house. He has sacrificed his son. He has circumcised himself. He has done everything for God. They had preached the gospel. Men like Paul, they had suffered. They had been beaten. And they knew that their reward was great. So they could not wait to live. So people who don't labor for God, it's as if, they know that they have nothing in heaven. Nothing is waiting for them. They have not laid up anything. They nothing. So because they are, all their treasures are here, their heart is here. So if you want to become heavenly minded, where you start to think about things that are above, start laboring for God. Start actually living for God. Start actually doing what the Bible says. By the time you begin to heap up a reward, you will not know when you start longing for Jesus to come so you can leave this earth.